Hey guys, thanks for joining us on Family Life Today here on YouTube. YouTube. Make sure you subscribe. You don't want to miss any episodes, so hit the little bell and you'll get notifications and you won't miss anything. And if this encourages you, like it and, and share, share it with it. your friends. Yeah, share it with your friends. Yeah, welcome to Family Life Today. Teenage years are very hard, and so we encourage parents, stay relational. The best thing you could do is self-care and stay relational. That will go a long way. How do we stay anchored in the storms? And how do we remember who we are so we can remind our teenagers who they are? Welcome to Family Life Today, where we want to help you pursue the relationships that matter most. I'm Ann Wilson. And I'm Dave Wilson, and you can find us at FamilyLifeToday.com or on our Family Life app. This is Family Life Today. Okay, let's talk teenage years. Let's do. As a parent. Oh, no. Do you remember those years? <laughs> yes, you do. That was like 15 They were some of my ago. favorite years. Oh, I love the teenage years. And yet they were some of my most dreaded mistakes. Yeah, I mean, our listeners have heard, and if they've read our book, they know about you uh, in the snowbank. Yeah. You don't need to tell the whole story, but it was, okay. a, it was a frustrating time. Okay, so we are with a bunch of our friends, and we're all at this big potluck, and somebody says, hey, somebody's going to pray. So the entire room is silent. There's probably 30 people. There's probably 20 kids. All from our church. And suddenly you hear someone say, this food looks like poop. <laughs> and that's our son. <laughs> and I give him the eye like, oh, you are in so much trouble. So... That goes on. I'm totally humiliated. Later, we're leaving, and I say, hey, hon, could you walk your brother, put your brother on your back, because he didn't bring his shoes for some reason, and take him out to the car? And then again, the room's silent, but our son says, I have to do everything in this family. <laughs> and so now I'm following him out. He's carrying this son, and now we are out of all the ears and so I say you are in so much trouble that was so disrespectful and that was embarrassing we get to the car there's a snowbank and he's putting his little brother into the car and I see this snowbank and the sun is off balance and so I take my shoulder and I just nudge him and he falls into the snowbank I get into the car and I lock all the car doors <laughs> and now the sun is pounding on the door my husband the pastor is coming into the car and he says what's happening right now <laughs> so he finally gets in the car because I unlock it and I start crying saying, I am the worst mom ever and I will never talk about parenting ever again. And here we are talking we about are. parenting <laughs> with uh, two dads yeah, who yeah. Uh, wrote a book about it, but also have studied brain science mm -hmm. as it relates to marriage and life and faith and now parenting. So welcome back to Family Life Today. We got Marcus Warner and Chris Gorsey with us. Thank you for being here. Hey, thank That's you. our pleasure. Yeah, yeah, yeah we've here. already we talked about it. We need you guys we so do. much. Aww. Not just Aww. us. Every <laughs> parent needs you. I mean, this latest book, The Four Habits of Raising Joy, Phil kids. Remind us what the four habits are, and then let's talk about how do you apply them to adult age, teenage age kids? No, absolutely. Uh, so the four habits are A, B, C, D, and you can think A, B with the right side of the brain, C, D with the left side of the brain dominantly. But it is uh, attune uh, to their emotions, read their body language. B is help them bounce back from their emotion. C is correct with care. And D is develop discipline relationally. See, I did that perfectly with the snowbank. Yeah, you did. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, tell us what well, we did wrong. Yeah. There. <laughs> well, honestly, I'm listening to the story going. Every parent, right, has a story like yeah. this yeah. because what it means is that my emotional capacity got overwhelmed, hmm. and the switch in my brain that controls whether or not I stay myself and act like myself had gone off, hmm. and you turned into a different person momentarily. I did turn into right? a different person. So as soon as your switch came back online. You were mortified, yeah. right? Because you're like, that's not like me to do that. And so now your true self is having an argument with the <laughs> false self that was up there a minute ago going, you know, will the real me please stand up? And it's confusing and it's shaming. And we've all been there, right? We've all Which have... is interesting too, because the enemy of our soul is saying, yes. that's your true self. That it, person yeah. you just became, that's who you are. And then God is saying, no, it's not. That's not who I created you to be. Exactly. Too many of us identify ourselves by our malfunctions. 
and not by who we are when we're living with joy. Mm. The identity center of the brain is the highest level of brain function. It's on the right side of the brain. And really what we're talking about is how do I parent with my relational circuitry on Mm. as opposed to parenting with my relational circuitry off? Because when my relational circuitry goes off, I do turn into a different person. And that's what our kids kind of sense in us. Like, which dad am I talking to right now? (laughs) Right? Which mom am I talking to? And what they're saying is you change, right? You know, if you're feeling this emotion, you don't act like you do when you're feeling that emotion. And I get scared of you when you're feeling this emotion. Mm. But I love being around you when you're in this one, right? So we all have those holes. And that's part of what we're trying to do in growing our own maturity is filling out those holes of the emotions that cause us to turn into something. Else. So Chris, how do we get the switch on? Yeah, you know, there's a couple of things that we can do to get the switch back on. Marcus and I uh, have an acrostic called Cake. And so I cake, love all your acrostics. A, B, C, D, yeah, yeah, Cake. Total acrostic, we guys. try to keep it easy here. So the C is just for curiosity. So we can notice, am I relational right now? Am I curious about what you're thinking? So curiosity is a very quick way to go, you know what, I'm not curious right now because I'm really mad at you. That's a good sign I'm not relational. And the A is just for appreciation. Can I feel appreciation? So appreciation is just what we call package joy. Can you think of something from your day that was good and can you feel that? And so when our relational circuit is off, we can't feel appreciation. We're like, no, I'm just really mad. So if you can take a moment and just pause and catch your breath and think about something that was good, one of God's gifts to you, that can actually help to get this relational circuit back on. I mean, are you saying that even as Ann is walking out to the car with our oldest in front of her, she could have possibly, even though she's frustrated from what happened inside the room, just right away going, okay, what am I thinking? What am I feeling? Am I curious about how CJ's doing? A... You know, I could be thankful right now. I got a son. This is awesome. Yeah, with a little bit of practice. So if I would have been there, the first thing I would probably have you do is just take some deep breaths and just, you know, breathe. You're really upset right now. Just take some deep breaths. Chris, what... where were you? <laughs> yeah, where were you yeah. that just take some deep breaths? That's but it. we can do that with a spouse, though, Yes, too. we can. Mm. Yes, we can. And just remembering, you know, and it just takes a little bit of practice. If you practice it on the good days, it'll show up on the hard days. Mm, but if we good. don't practice, it's definitely not going to show up on the hard days. And the K and K is just kindness. Do I feel like being kind. No, no, I don't. I right? do not. So when that circuit's yeah. off, you don't want to be kind. You want to, you know, yeah. want to blast this child here. The E is eye contact. Do you have eye contact with your child or not? You know, kid, do you feel like looking your child in the eye right now? And again, when we're in non-relational mode, what we call enemy mode, right? The people I love feel like enemies instead of my son that I love. We don't want to look at him or we want to give him the eye of death because we're really mad. (laughs) (laughs) And I think too, what was going on with me, I was embarrassed. Yes. Very complex. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was embarrassed embarrassed. because what did this do? It made me look bad as a parent. And so really that's very self-centered, you know, instead of taking that breath, being the parent, having my switch on, being able to look at CJ, what should I have said then? You know, what's that conversation look like after I'm calm and he's calm? Well, it can look a lot of different ways, of course. Let me say one thing about cake here, which is that it's both a way to assess where I'm, if I am fit to be having this conversation. Oh, that's good. Yes. Right. So the point here is that if I am walking out to a car and I am feeling about my son, no curiosity, no appreciation, <laughs> no no kindness. kindness, and the only eye contact I want to make with him is to stare him down, yeah. right? Then <laughs> what it tells me is I have a problem, mm. okay? And my problem is not my son. My problem is that half of my brain has shut down. Mm-hmm. Just knowing that right. is Just yeah. knowing so that good. is helpful, right? And so I'm going, my problem that I need to fix right now is I need to get the right side of my brain back online so that whatever I say to my child, I act like myself when I do it. Mm. So say nothing. Yeah, if it's you're better at that point. it's better at that point to say nothing. Yeah. And work on finding some curiosity and finding some appreciation and thinking of a way to do this with kindness and then engaging. Which we totally did later. Yeah. Because yeah. the switch was back on and yes. I was back to myself. Yes. Exactly. Which is why, you know, your kids still probably look back on their childhood with joy mm-hmm. overall as the yeah. general feeling. Yeah. Right? You We've prepared. all got these moments where, well, yeah, that was not a joyful moment in my child. You know, but the goal here is that I knew and this is where kids know, I know that my dad was happy to have me around, mm. right? That's a joy bond. That means that you're going to have a joy-filled kids when they know instinctively, you know, my dad loves having me around. 
but then they also learn my dad doesn't like having me around if I have this emotion or this emotion or this emotion. <laughs> or this, you know, and oh, so what yeah. happens is they form a fear bond with you when they have certain emotions and a joy bond with you when they don't. And I Do will, kids of all age have that? Yes, yeah. even teenagers. Yeah. So, yeah, especially, yeah. yeah. Which is where we started this thing, right? Is yeah. That is, how does this apply to the teenagers? And you know, when I don't know what to do, my default setting is validate, hmm. right? I'm like, I don't know what to do with you right now, so I need to attune, try to read your body language, and see if I can't validate your emotion, which means I don't have to agree that you should be feeling this way. I just have to recognize my son or my daughter right now is feeling a level 10 sadness. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why. I don't think they should be feeling that sad, but they are. So what I don't want to do is minimize it and go, well, it's not that bad. You shouldn't be. You have a lot to be thankful for. Right. right, Exactly. You know, stop being sad, start being thankful. Aren't you a good Christian? Right. Yeah. That's not, that's not going to be helpful there. What we need to do is meet them in their big sadness. Like you are really sad right now, aren't you? So this is something is really, really bothering you. Hmm. And so with the tone of my voice, with the expression on my face, with my words, I want to let them know that I see them. If I am accurate, then their reaction should be nodding. Hmm. Like, yeah, that's right. That's what's going on. I can mess it up, too. I can say, why are you so angry? And they're <laughs> not actually angry, right? Yeah, you know? yeah. Uh, that's not going to work. So uh, validating has to be accurate. And you are validating their right brain emotion. What you're not validating is any narrative they are expressing or any beliefs that they are stating. In other words, you don't say, I feel like I'm the biggest loser in the world. Well, you don't validate that by saying, well, you know, you are the biggest loser in the world. No, you're, <laughs> yeah. Right? No, yeah. you're reading what's the emotion behind that. It's right. like, oh, you're feeling a tremendous amount of shame right now, aren't you? That's what this is. And so you're, you're walking them through that and you validate their emotion. And then once you've done a good job of validating, then you can move to comforting. What most parents, the mistake we make is we try to comfort kids of all ages mm. without validating the emotion first. And... It sends an unmeant message. We don't mean to send the message, but that I don't care about you. I just want you to get fixed. For my sake. For my yeah, sake. Right? right. It feels like selfish parenting to the kid. And it, it's helpful to know for teenagers, the teenage brain is going through a house cleaning. So what that means is there's a whole rewiring going on around puberty. And so whatever skills were there they will still be there after this house cleaning process. But if they weren't there, they're going to be really harder to learn after the house cleaning. So that's why parents want to pull out their hair sometimes with teenagers, because there's hormones, there's emotions, everything is big, everything is loud, and it feels like everything's difficult. Well, that's because the brain is very irritable during this house cleaning. And so basically the brain is saying, what do we use? We'll keep. Whatever we don't use, we're going to start getting rid of. So teenage years are very hard. And so we encourage parents, stay relational. The best thing you could do is self-care and stay relational. That will go a long way. How do we stay anchored in the storms? And how do we remember who we are so we can remind our teenagers who they are? Mm. I found, too, that the biggest challenges we face in the teen years are emotions that they didn't learn how to bounce back from as children. So in other words, when they get to be teenagers, they're now feeling really big emotions and as kids, mm. we weren't able to remain relational with them and comfort them, and they didn't get that really solid foundation. And so now as teens, they feel doubly alone with this emotion. And when I feel alone with an emotion, it's traumatizing to me. Mm. So when I feel like I feel so much shame right now, and I can't tell anybody, you know, I'm just going to hide. I'm not going to let anybody know. Or I'm so mad at the world, and I'm so angry, you know, but my parents don't care. And so what happens is teenage years are get especially hard because they're having really big emotions and with no expectation that those emotions are going to get validated and that there's going to be any kind of connection to them other than a correction, like stop having such big emotions, you're ruining my day. Listeners right now with teenagers are saying yes, yes, yes. And I think what's hard too is because as parents are trying to build relationship, many times the teen will push them away mm. and the parent will leave. In our parenting book, we said that in the teenage years, it's all about relationship, but a lot of parents are like, so what's that look like? Because they're pushing me away, they're actually flipping me sarcastic remarks and sort of acting like I'm an idiot and getting in their car because they now can and driving away and yet I'm supposed to be pursuing and have a relationship but they don't want it but yeah. do they so pursuing a relationship out of fear makes you a doormat 
Right. What and, do you mean by that? Well, it's like if I'm uh, like, please don't run away from me. Please, we have to be in a relationship. Please, I couldn't handle it emotionally if you don't like me. Mm. That turns me into a doormat. They perceive that. They pick up on it. They know they can walk all over us and get away with anything. Mm. You know, we haven't talked a whole lot about the C and the D, right? The yeah. correcting yeah. with care and the developing disciplines relationally. But there is a, I have to be stubborn as a parent on things. You know, so I may lead with this and I am meeting them in their emotion, but it doesn't mean I'm not going to correct. Uh, especially with teens, what I would tell my kids a lot is my goal for you is I want you to be successful. All right. What I mean by that is I want you to be a high achiever. I want you to have lots of friends because friendship's really big in the teen years, right. right? I want you to be, have a lot of friends. I want you to be the sort of person that people like hanging out with. I want you to, to have a family of your own someday. I'm casting this picture for them, this vision of, I want you to have a successful life. The path you're on right now is not going to get you there. And so it's like, we've got to make a correction here. Mm. So there have to be some consequences right now for what you've done and what you're doing, the attitude you're displaying that you've displayed, we are not going to be tolerated in this house. Okay. We are putting down some boundaries, but I have done the validating and, and the other things first. I've met them where they are in their emotions first, but now I'm correcting them and saying, but this is not going to keep happening this way. Yeah. So if you only have a tuning and building bounce and you never get to correcting, yeah. you just spoil your kids. Is that true for the toddler too or the child up to four years old or even later? We always tell parents you can't spoil babies or toddlers. Like they're in receiving mode. And so ultimately it's about the parent fear. Well, I'm afraid if I do this, my child's going to get spoiled. And in the book, Marcus and I really, you know, try to bring this home in bold letters is you cannot spoil an infant. They are receiving, but you can be an example to help them better learn how to manage what they feel because they're going to take that training and they'll use that every day of their life, especially when they get into the teenage years where their brain is going through the big house cleaning. And so ultimately, how do we help people manage what they feel? And how do I, as a parent, not be fearful? And I help parents, what are your fears here with your teenager? What are you afraid is going to happen? And, well, I'm afraid my child's not going to like me. Yeah. You know, I'm afraid they're going to be mad at me. Okay, well, those are valid fears. Now, how do you stay your relational self? How would you navigate this without that fear? So it really helps to identify what are the fears that are driving this bus? Let's acknowledge them. Let's give them to Jesus. Let's give an example. My son or daughter is depressed. I feel like they're suicidal. Mm. My fear is they're going to take their life. Yeah, that's a very big... Yeah, it doesn't get common. much more extreme than yeah. that. Right. So there were a lot of steps to get there mm -hmm. first. But secondly, once you are there, what you want to let them know is I'm here for you all the way and whatever's going on, no matter how dark this gets. One of the mistakes, especially Christians, I think, tend to make when it comes to hopelessness is that we want to cut it off and inject hope Yes. instead mm -hmm. of allowing people to fully express the level of hopelessness they're in. I'll tell you sort of illustrate, like Dr. Wilder was telling me, of, like he often gets asked to come in and sit in on, you know, the hardest client and somebody, you know, when he's in as a guest and uh, somebody's like, this person's really depressed. They could really use some hope. Please inject some hope into them. And so the person says, well, you know, sometimes at night I... You know, I we just wish I wasn't here. And he looked at him and said, you know, and I bet it gets even worse than that, doesn't it? And the person <laughs> looked around like, um, yeah, it does. It gets darker than that. And he, they went on to express that sometimes I think about killing myself and doing this stuff. I said, you know what? And sometimes it gets even darker than that, doesn't it? And they're like, yeah. You know, sometimes I've even thought about this, but nobody has ever let them fully get into the darkest to place. To feel what they need to feel. To feel what they need to feel and know that somebody is still happy to be with me in my darkness. Mm. So it's kind of like Job's friends. They did a really good job sitting with him for those days yeah. when they just sat there. Yeah. But the moment they started yeah. to try to explain it or justify it or fix him what miserable comforters you are job <laughs> said like if only they could have stayed silent so in a sense sometimes you know people just need to feel seen heard and understood i need to be able to feel my hopelessness and if i am sitting with my friend who's hopeless if my brain knows how to get back to relational glad to be together joy i'm not afraid to go to that level of hopelessness because mm. i've been there before and i know how to get back if i don't then i will try to stop it i'll minimize it i'll try to put the fire out and then the person's going to feel misunderstood because i'm trying to fix it yeah. or i'm trying to shortchange it so 
it's very good, especially for parents to know, like your children ultimately have to learn how to manage what they feel, which means as parents, we have to yeah. learn how to manage what we feel. Mm. Right. And there's a time to getting professionals involved. So we're not yeah. trying to say this is a replacement yeah. for that. Yeah. yeah. But it's like if you're getting, you know, professional help in there, your job as a parent, what is it I'm supposed to be doing? Mm. And part of this is to let them know I'm happy to be with you no matter how dark yeah. things get for you, that you're not alone. Yeah. A lot of us say that, right? Oh, I'll be here for you, you mm. know. But they kind of already know where our limit is on how far down we'll go with them. So that's why our own capacity has to grow in these areas, and we have to push into it. It's not easy. Yeah, what I'm hearing not. you saying too is that feeling that our kids or even our spouse gets that, like they want to be with me. Yes. They are excited that I'm here. Yeah. No matter what age or even a spouse, that is really key. It's huge. Yeah. Well, have you ever seen your kid, you know, and in some kind of a meltdown or whatever and had the thought, you know what, I'm the perfect person to be here right now because I know exactly what to do. I'm going to go in here. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to take care of and you're genuinely happy to be with them in the middle of their meltdown because you're not overwhelmed by what's going on. You're thinking to yourself, I love this kid. I'm exactly who they need right now. I'm going to come in here and mm -hmm. be with them as they get through this, help them recover. And you're thinking that because, and you may not be telling yourself, I'm the perfect person to be here, but you kind of have that confidence, like, I know what to do. Mm. I'm not I'm not overwhelmed by this. Let's dive in. So a lot of us as parents don't have that, right? Because we don't actually have a picture in our head of what I'm supposed to do. Right. So we have to grow that over time. If we if we can only start where we're at. Mm. So if you're starting your parenting years without a lot of these skills, you're like, well, I guess I know that's part of my homework now is beginning to develop skills on how I recover from emotions so that I can pass those on to my kids. And you know, at the end of the day, our children need to know they're not alone. Hmm. Whatever we can do as parents to remind and show our children you're not alone, that will go a long way. Because a lot of times as parents, we feel like we have to have all the answers. We have to fix this. We have to put the fire out. As we learn to manage what we feel, we're showing our children and demonstrating this is the kind of people we are. I love how Jesus wept when he came upon the grieving community for Lazarus. Like Jesus knew what he was going to do, mm. but he wept. He shared it. He didn't tell him, hey, there's no need to be sad. You don't have to. Oh, no. He actually entered in and shared the, the communal grief. And that's just so helpful for parents to hold on to. Like, mm. look, you don't have to have every right answer, but just get good at just being with your children and letting them know they're loved. I'm glad to be with you. Even in this mess, I'm glad I can be with you and walk you through that. That is just, it's life changing. That is such a great word for parents of any age child. You said your child is longing to look at your face and see that you are happy that they're your child. I think that doesn't change when they're a teenager. Or adults. That's right. It just doesn't change. They want to know, are you still pleased that I'm your child? And when they feel and sense that from us, even when we're disciplining them, they feel secure. That's it. They'll use that for the rest of their lives. That no matter what happens here, I am loved. I belong. I'm going to be all right, no matter what. Mm, yeah, that's and that's good. what we mean by joy filled. Yeah. yeah. And the goal here is to start a joy revolution, right? We live in a very low joy culture. Wow. We live in a very low yeah. joy church for the most part. And a lot of us were raised in low joy families. And what we're really after here is if we're going to start a joy revolution in the culture, it's got to start with the families. And we're better than the Christian families. <laughs> Right, and so we often, know we know the answer. Right, yes. Yes. we know the end of the right. story. Yeah, yeah. That's right. and I find that so often Christian families have been so focused on behavior, yes, that they've been focusing on making sure their kids behave like Christians. Mm. And I look back, God created us to be part of His family. Mm. And what, what does he want for his family? He wants us all to love each other, to love him, and for there to be joy to be fulfilled, or mm. our joy to be complete. So it's all going back to that. How do we kind of fulfill God's original intention for creating humans in the first place? He wanted a joy-filled family. And when he sees us, there's a smile. Yep. Yes. Yeah. And our sons and daughters should feel the same thing from us. Mm. Yep. That's Thank right. you, guys. This has been awesome. So good. Thank you. It's been so good.
What do you think your kids would say if at dinner tonight you asked the question, do you think we're a joy-filled family? I mean, for the most part, not all the time, nobody is all the time, but do you think that for the most part, our family is joy-filled? And if they said yes, it'd be a good follow-up to say, what is it that produces joy in our family? What makes us joy-filled? And if they said no, then ask the question, what do you think it would take for us to be a joy-filled family? And get ready for those answers. Maybe get a copy of the book we've been talking about this week that Marcus Warner and Chris Corsi have written called The Four Habits of Joy-Filled Kids. It's a book we've got in our Family Life Today Resource Center. In fact, we've been sending this book out all week to those of you who can help support the ministry of Family Life Today. I don't know how many of you realize this, but this program every day... This podcast, if you're listening to it as a podcast, is all possible because listeners like you make it possible. Family Life Today would not exist if it weren't for friends of the ministry, donors who step forward and say, this is important to me and my family. We think it's important for our culture and our community, and we want to help expand the outreach of Family Life Today. So thanks to those of you who have given in the past. If you can give today to support our mission to effectively develop godly marriages and families who change the world one home at a time, go to our website, familylifetoday.com, to make a donation or call 1-800-FL-TODAY and make a donation online. Again, the website is familylifetoday.com or call 1-800-358-6329, 1-800-F as in family, L as in life, and then the word today, and ask for your copy of the book, The Four Habits of Joy-Filled Kids, when you make your donation. Now, Dave and Ann Wilson had the opportunity to uh, continue their conversation with Marcus Warner and Chris Corsi talking about whether it's really impossible to spoil a toddler. It's one of the things that came up this week. They also talked about the difference between empathy and sympathy. Just lots more about how we create joy-filled kids. That conversation is available on the Family Life Today app. If you've not already downloaded the Family Life app, go to the app store for your device and just type in Family Life as one word. Download the app, and you'll have access to this additional bonus content with Chris Corsi and Marcus Warner. If you've already got the app, it should be right there available to you, and you can listen to more on this subject with Dave and Ann Wilson. Now, tomorrow, we want to talk about the importance, the value of boundaries. A lot of times we think boundaries constrain us or constrict us. Well, Ashley Hales joins us tomorrow to talk about how appropriate boundaries can actually open things up for you in life. We're going to talk about what it looks like to lead a spacious life tomorrow, and I hope you can join us for that. On behalf of our hosts, Dave and Ann Wilson, I'm Bob Lapine. We'll see you back next time for another edition of Family Life Today. Family Life Today is a production of Family Life, a crew ministry, helping you pursue the relationships that matter most.